Support for this podcast is provided by Avalara. If you're responsible for the financial well-being of any company, you've probably heard about Avalara. And if not, listen up. Avalara are the folks who simplify sales tax for businesses of all kinds. As we've covered on this podcast, there are endless complications in sales tax. For example, if you buy deodorant in Texas, you're going to get charged sales tax, but not if you buy antiperspirant. Who would know this stuff? Well, Avalara does, because they keep track of thousands and thousands of products and how they're taxed in more than 13,000 tax jurisdictions in the United States alone. With more than 1,000 signed partner integrations, Avalara likely integrates with the ERP, e-commerce, mobile payment, and point-of-sale systems you use today. Find out how your business can be sales tax ready at avalara.com slash tax notes. That's avalara.com slash tax notes. Avalara, tax compliance done right. Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the un-OECD. With an increasingly digital and evolving global economy, governments and international bodies have been forced to look for a way to update the international tax system for the 21st century. Although much of this work has been driven recently by the OECD and its inclusive framework, other groups, such as the United Nations Tax Committee, have begun to emerge as prominent participants. Here to talk more about the UN Tax Committee is Tax Notes contributing editor Nana Amasarfo. Ama, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be back. Now, I understand you recently spoke with someone about the role of the UN Tax Committee in the international tax world and how it can be a better advocate for developing countries. Can you tell us about your guest? I spoke with Abdul Muhit Chowdhury, and he is a senior program officer with the South Center Tax Initiative. So the South Center is a Geneva-based NGO of developing countries, and Abdul's work focuses on international tax cooperation and policy. So helping developing countries with international tax capacity building, and then also helping them navigate multilateral discussions. So he is very well acquainted with the work of the UN Tax Committee, which addresses the international tax needs of developing countries. All right. And can you tell us a bit about what you two talked about? Well, this is a really interesting and pivotal time for the UN Tax Committee. It's about to elect new members, and they will start around the same time that the OECD is expected to reach an agreement on BEPS 2.0. So Abdul, in response, wrote a really insightful article on how the UN Tax Committee can become more effective for developing countries. And in our conversation, he expanded on some of the concerns that he highlighted in the article. So he discussed the need for transparency and how members and the agenda are selected, and he offered some suggestions on how the committee can expand its resources and build a really robust secretariat and make the most of its members' expertise. He also explained what is at stake here for developing countries if things don't change. And of course, I had to ask him, what kind of relationship does he think the UN Tax Committee should have with the OECD moving forward? All right, let's go to that interview. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So this is a really important time for the international tax world, especially with international tax reform and COVID-19 recovery. And it's also an important time for the UN Tax Committee, particularly since the current session is winding down and countries are nominating new members. And so the new committee will be weighing in on these issues. So I'm hoping that you can describe for our listeners, those who aren't familiar with the UN Tax Committee, two things. First, the Tax Committee's mandate, and then secondly, the Tax Committee's makeup. So how many members are selected? How long are their terms? How is the membership of countries determined? And how is reappointment to the committee determined? Yeah, so the mandate of the committee, which, by the way, is a part of ECOSOC, it is basically to first and foremost take care of this document called the UN Model Tax Convention between developed and developing countries. And this is used as a basis for negotiating bilateral tax treaties and provides an alternative approach to the OECD's Model Tax Convention. And the two are quite similar, but in some important ways, they're quite different. And it's quite important for developing countries. For example, the rights of source countries are more prominently emphasized in the UN Model Tax Convention as opposed to the OECD Convention, which gives more primacy to the countries of residence. 
then another document which the tax committee so by the way the tax committee has a very long name it's un committee of experts on international cooperation in tax matters but usually it's informally referred to as the un tax committee so another document which it looks at is the manual for the negotiation of bilateral tax treaties between developed and developing countries and then this is what is mentioned in the mandate so the tax committee actually has gone through various avatars various forms and earlier it was called an ad hoc group of experts so the resolution which upgraded it from the ad hoc group into what it currently is it specified this mandate so these two documents are mentioned in the mandate but over time the committee has produced other documents as well so they have this transfer pricing manual and they have come out with this handbook on issues in the extractive sector so they keep coming out with uh, documents which are of interest to developing countries in particular in international tax matters and this is actually part of their mandate that when looking at issues of interest in international tax cooperation it has to give special emphasis to the issues of least developed countries and developing countries and economies in transition that's one thing another set of issues which the tax committee looks at is capacity building and providing technical assistance and in a general looking at any other issues which come up so in recent times they've branched out into environmental taxation after the sdgs were passed in 2015 uh, tax and its relationship to the sdgs so new and emerging issues as they come up so this is the uh, mandate of the tax committee broadly then the other question which you had was about the makeup of the committee so the committee is made up of members who very importantly are acting in their expert capacity so these are not country delegates these are not representatives but rather these are experts acting in their individual capacity so there are 25 members they serve a term for 4 years and it's not very clear as to how exactly the mix of countries is determined so if we see the previous ad hoc group which was the predecessor to the current tax committee it mentioned that there should be 10 developed countries and 15 developing countries and economies in transition and if you look at the current committee depending on your interpretation you can broadly argue that there are 15 to 16 developing countries and 10 or 9 developed countries though it's not very clear again who is a developing country and who is a developed country for example a country like singapore it's a part of the group of 77 officially but then again so in that sense it would count itself as a developing country in the world trade organization they call themselves the developing country but in reality many of the positions they take are in the interest of the developed countries so there are some ambiguities like that actually so this is the numerical mix but which countries actually get to be decided that is not very clear and that is something which in fact needs some transparency you had asked something about reappointment but before coming to that i think uh, it would also be interesting to see what is the procedure because what is happening now is that there's a nomination for new members so countries would make the nominations and the appointment is made by the secretary general uh, official code and code in consultation with uh, the member states but Uh, again the process is not very clear and this is something which needs some transparency actually so that uh, because it's a very important process and to be able to understand how that works it's very important that it's transparent but my understanding so far is that broadly uh, the secretariat takes a call or gives its assessment based on the nominations which are received these then go to the under secretary general of the department of economic and social affairs and from there it then goes to the secretary general but again this to my knowledge is not clearly documented and it would be welcome to have some transparency in this regard i see so following up on your concerns about transparency as you had mentioned a new committee is about to be selected i believe they will start work in july and so briefly what are your concerns about the tax committee as it currently operates so in the article which was uh, published by tax notes i had outlined these concerns and i will very briefly summarize them once again and add a couple of points which i didn't mention in the article actually so first point is that when countries are nominating experts then especially for developing countries it's very important that they nominate the best candidates possible because these are then going to set in a way international standards or shape international standards on tax so there are no criteria or guidelines at present for example it's not necessary that 
the nominee should have domain knowledge of international tax. Almost all of the members of the tax committee are with their tax departments. But if there are some criteria or some guidelines that the candidate should have some domain knowledge of uh, especially tax treaties or issues like transfer pricing or exchange of information, and they will have the support of their tax administration, then that would be very helpful because when these members are nominated, then this again ties up to the issue of the committee being an expert body. They are sort of working on their own. And this is especially the case for developing countries. But if some sort of criteria could be there that uh, when you nominate somebody, then the tax administration should also support them in their work, then this would really make it much more helpful uh, so that uh, especially for members from developing countries so that they can do their best with the support of the tax administration. Then another issue is that the agenda is decided with limited input from the members because you have a new nomination, you have a new set of members, and then the secretariat puts forward the agenda and they sort of yes or no it, but they don't really have a very substantive inputs into how exactly the agenda will be crafted. And this is one of the issues which has been raised in this uh, in the 21st session we just ended, that the inputs of UN member states should be solicited when deciding the agenda. And this is very important. So the way the agenda is decided is another issue. Then the staffing of the secretariat is an issue because we see that there is a preponderance of staff from OECD countries. And uh, some of them are even actually from the OECD, former OECD officials. This is a big problem because, I mean, um, it's in practice, it's, it's, it's very difficult to let go of that ideological baggage which you have. And especially given that the committee has a mandate to give special interest to developing countries and economies in transition, least developed countries, these then obviously will be issues which are of interest to source countries. And somebody from the OECD who their whole life has spent fighting for the rights of residence countries or developed countries, it's not very practical to expect them to suddenly turn around and start being very concerned about the developing countries. Then an other issue is that reappointment, which you had mentioned previously, is not very clear on what basis is somebody being reappointed. And this again is a process which needs some transparency. So these are some of the issues which were mentioned in the article. But another issue which I wanted to actually share is that some of the committee members, especially those who are from the developed countries, they are wearing two hats. So to have members of the UN tax committee who are wearing two hats, who are chairs or co-chairs of working parties in the OECD's inclusive framework, and are also office bearers in the UN tax committee will create some tension. If these people are also coordinators of a subcommittee or co-chairs of a subcommittee in the UN system, and also co-chairs or chairs of a working party in the OECD inclusive framework. That creates a sort of tension and in a way it's actually like a conflict of interest. So this is something which should be avoided. If uh, a member is there, then they should uh, have only one clear responsibility. Either you be a coordinator of a UN subcommittee or a co-chair of a UN tax committee uh, body or you be within the OECD inclusive framework system. But having both results where results in a system where ideas of one are being transplanted into the other, and usually it's a one-way flow of information. So this is also something which is a problem, actually, and which should be avoided in the UN Tax Committee. I see. What you've unpacked there, I think, really drives at the heart of some potentially substantial changes within the Tax Committee if they are addressed as you are advocating for. Now, as you had also explained in your piece, I mean, the UN Tax Committee has issued so many valuable resources for developing countries. Right now, it is working on its own digital tax proposal, a very well-known model treaty provision that addresses automated digital services. It's seen as a counterpart to the OECD's BEPS 2.0 project. And the committee has done its digital tax work and all of its other work under its mandates with a lack of resources. So can you share the ways in which the tax committee is under-resourced and what resources you think it needs to progress with its work? Yeah, so I think we can begin by looking at the staff which are employed. To my knowledge, the UN tax committee has I think about two full-time staff actually and maybe adding a few more I don't think it would be more than uh, seven or eight people and if you contrast that with the OECD's uh, staff in the center for tax policy they might have around 150 plus 
so that gives you a very uh, concrete idea of the differential between the two institutions and the kind of work that by implication both institutions are capable of and another thing which we can look at is the budget how much budget is given to the oecd's center for tax policy and how much funding the un tax committee has there was a trust fund which was set up for the un tax committee some years ago and to my knowledge only one country in the whole world has uh, contributed to it i think that's india it's given about 200000 so far with that it's of course the committee is uh, you know doing what it can but it really gives you an idea now this has some uh, practical implications so the first thing is that the members as mentioned are experts acting in their individual capacity so this individual capacity phrase can be interpreted in a very literal sense that they are literally doing the work by themselves and given that they are also tax officials and quite senior some of them some of them are even the heads of the revenue service they have a uh, huge amounts of responsibilities already so to expect that these members will be able to do this very complex work by themselves is not very easy and for that they need some help but if the tax committee doesn't have that amount of staff or they have not much money to hire consultants then the amount of help which they can give to the members is also limited which affects the output then the second question comes that even if you have um, staff then what kind of staff are those and as mentioned a lot of the staff either come from developed countries or oecd countries which are one and the same or they come directly from the oecd formally now again as mentioned if you have spent your whole life fighting for the rights of residents countries then it's very difficult to do a u turn and suddenly become concerned about developing countries so if a member from a developing country is trying to work on an issue and take that issue forward and the uh, secretariat member they are working with is of completely the different mentality then uh, it's not very easy to go forward it would be a tense and harmonious relationship you would say one thing but then you would get something which says the opposite of or you know at least is not taking your perspective forward so because of that some of the developing country members find it difficult to uh, rely extensively on on the staff of the secretariat itself and that was also one of the issues which was raised in uh, my article that the staffing of the secretariat should have more people from developing countries and the the developing world it may be poor and so on but there is a lot of talent there are a lot of very eager and enthusiastic and intelligent people who can really be brought into the tax committee and who have a lot to offer actually people who have been working in tax administration who have experience in tax treaty the exchange of information transfer pricing from the perspective of the interests of source countries these kinds of staff can and should be brought into the secretariat and that would actually reduce the load on the developing country members and it would make it easier for them to take the help of the of the secretariat and produce more work actually so to summarize once again first the the committee doesn't have all that much money with which they they have limited resources and secondly the, the ones that they do have it's highly oecd or developed country oriented um, some of the staff so that makes it difficult actually for the developing country members to take their agenda forward and then there's another aspect which again goes back to the issue of them of the committee being an expert body and the members acting in their individual capacity so if you look at the way some revenue administrations are structured they have entire divisions dealing with the discussions in the inclusive framework the foreign tax division or the tax treaties division or whatever it's called you have entire teams who are following the negotiations in the inclusive framework in work, working party 11 6 whatever but in the case of the tax committee that, that is not the case because the member is again an expert in their individual capacity so the governments uh, often feel that oh this person is acting on their own and you know they are experts in their individual capacities so they don't always uh, provide them with support with an entire team so this is actually a systemic problem because the committee is not an intergovernmental body and as uh, some of the listeners may know that the group of 77 has been demanding for decades that 
the UN Tax Committee should be made into an intergovernmental tax body. And this was uh, raised in a big way in the 2015 Addis Ababa discussion, but it was shot down by the OECD countries. And if this had gone through, then this problem would have been solved. The members who were nominated were, would have been nominated in their official capacity and their tax administration could then have said that, okay, this person is now doing official work and they could have provided them with a team who would uh, shoulder their responsibility. And this would have helped them, especially those members from developing countries to do a much better job, actually. Wow. So you have offered a really broad array of solutions that the tax committee could rely on to boost its support. So in a world where the UN tax committee does have more resources and more support, what kinds of work would you like to see the committee tackle? The existing mandate of the committee, I think, is broad enough in itself, capacity building and providing uh, model documents and shaping standards. And uh, on this, I think it can just do more better, as they say. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California, Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. If you're hearing this, you're clearly interested in taxes and you might benefit from checking out our sponsor or you might know someone who will. The UC Irvine Law School offers a one-year full-time program that's been ranked the number one graduate tax program on the West Coast. Students can expect a unique academic experience that combines in-depth doctrinal work and practical perspective to prepare students for successful careers in tax law. The small student to faculty ratio also ensures that students get the attention they need to succeed. Applications are open now. For non-US applications, the deadline is April 1st, 2021. For U.S.-based students, the deadline is July 1st. To apply today, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. Now, you described in your article, I thought very effectively, a series of solutions that the tax committee can implement to become more inclusive and effective. So taking a step back here and looking at the bigger picture, What is at stake if nothing changes within the tax committee, if things remain as they are? That's a very important question. It's interesting to see that many of the reasons why the tax committee has come into the limelight in recent times is because they have offered a solution to a pressing problem by the initiatives of the tax committee on Article 12b, which is their proposed solution on automated digital services. And even some of the work which is being undertaken on taxing software payments as royalties, they have tapped into uh, what is arguably the key discussion in international tax. But this has happened really because of the individual drive of two or three tax committee members at the most. And when the next set of members is chosen, there's no guarantee that you would again have um, members who are as extraordinarily committed to step up and, and provide this sort of initiative because... Speaking of the digital economy specifically, the, for the longest time, the UN Tax Committee's uh, approach was, let's see what's happening in the inclusive framework and let's see and let's see and let's see. It was the role of a passive observer, actually. But due to the initiative of a few members, this changed and they actually started providing their own perspective. So if these kind of changes are not made through which the tax committee can become more effective, then there's a danger that it would once again relapse into its passive role and it just observes what the OECD is doing. And this would be a very dangerous thing because then the developing countries would have no way to voice their concerns, voice an alternative. It would be reliant upon the OECD solution. I mean, Article 12b, all said and done. Even if you look at the most basic question, such as the question of nexus, if you look at the proposal in Pillar 1, there is, I think, I mean, in, in India, there is these seven levels of hell, you know, in Hindu mythology, after which you finally reach the end. You, you have this bottomless pit of thresholds after which you can finally say that, okay, this company now is eligible for a nexus, which would be very, very difficult for uh, most developing tax administrators to administer and which would severely exclude many, many of the tech giants and the highly digitalized companies. But Article 12p, it just says that it has no threshold. You know, the income would automatically be deemed to arise once the automated digital service has been provided. So this is really the difference when you have a solution which is prepared by developing countries themselves and when developing countries have to rely on this enormously complicated apparatus within the OECD system. Of course, within the UN Tax Committee, there are developed countries as well and their points of view have also been raised on Article 12b. 
But the larger point is that if, if the UN tax committee is not reformed and if these changes don't take place, then developing countries would lose a very valuable site through which they can raise their concerns. And this would deprive them of revenue. And we are living in a time when there is so much of uh, economic collapse, recession, and it would be, be really unthinkable. Uh, I, I shudder to think of what would happen to the developing countries if, if this option is taken away, actually. So, Abdul, your article points out that the tax committee members can be stretched very thin because they have to juggle their UN duties alongside their regular jobs. So what support do you think that member states and the UN can provide? I know you already touched a bit on the funding issue, but for example, are secondments a realistic option in this case? That's a very good suggestion, the idea of secondments. And this would be a great idea, actually, because first, uh, one of the implications of that would be that the the committee members can be much more focused. And as a result, they could perhaps even have shorter terms. Instead of a four-year term, it could be a two-year term. They can really be full-time devoted to this. And hopefully, the committee would also be able to come up with decisions quicker, which would also be much more helpful. So this is definitely a very practical option. And it's open to question whether that means that the members should come to the UN in New York and work there. But I think for a lot of them, another equally interesting option would be that they stay in their own countries and they keep working from there and they are, they are paid an allowance. But second months is a very good idea, actually. And apart from that, as mentioned, uh, the tax administrations, when the member state is nominating the nominee, then the tax administration can also try to support them to the extent possible by recognizing that the work which they are doing is, of course, it's in their expert capacity, but to the extent possible that the tax administration can support them so that their uh, workload is reduced. In developing countries, that's a bit difficult because Usually these departments, international tax divisions are staffed thin. Uh, We have a few people doing a lot of different things, but to the extent possible, they could provide them with support would be very welcome. I see. And then what about funding for the trust fund that you had mentioned? Do you have any ideas on that? It's really unfortunate that only one country has contributed to this so far and uh, more countries, which especially those which are being affected by uh, illicit financial flows, It's in their interest that they come forward and uh, contribute to the trust fund. So your article made me think about access and transparency. And I'm wondering if you think if there's room for the tax committee to reform how it interacts with the public. Is there room for the committee to be more transparent with the public about the work that it's doing and soliciting feedback? Yeah, I think that's definitely, uh, there is a lot of scope as mentioned Many things, for example, how the uh, mix of countries is just, is determined, who is a developing country. Uh, as, as mentioned, Singapore has, uh, if you look at any of the issues which are of interest to developing countries like taxation of offshore and direct transfers or um, uh, software payments as royalties, Singapore, which is ostensibly a developing country, has really not taken any positions in favor of the developing countries. So which countries are determined and whether they are counted as developed or developing countries, some transparency is needed on this, how the members are appointed specifically, what is the exact process, some transparency on that, how a member is reappointed, then even when it comes to, as you mentioned, the engagement with the public, if you want to see how uh, voting decisions are taken, that's not very clear actually. To my knowledge, you have to go to the reports, the annual or I don't know what, what frequency they come out with these reports based on what was discussed, uh, yes, after each session, the session reports where they say, okay, this is how the discussion went and this is how the voting took place. But it's not very clear, for example, which member voted how. That information is not readily available. So how voting takes place, I think that that's something which should be more transparent. And the functioning of the subcommittees as well, I think uh, we see that if you look at the composition of subcommittees, there are a huge number of observers And uh, there are enormous uh, amounts of uh, members from the business community. I think, for example, you look at the extractive subcommittee. Uh, You have all these oil and gas and mining companies over there, and they are heavily involved in the preparation of the documents which form the basis for subsequent decisions. So again, uh, who gets to be on the subcommittee? How are these observers uh, found out? There should be some transparency on that as well. Then when it comes to engaging with the public directly, Yes, definitely, there should be more time 
for public consultations we see often that the turnaround time is not that much you have for example you have an upcoming committee session now the agenda is not yet up so soon we'll see that the agenda will be up and this would be quite close to the actual meeting itself and then there will be some time to comment on the documents but it won't be that much time and we need some more time actually to comment on documents because again for developing countries where which don't have a huge tax administration they would need some time to process and digest the issues which are going on and this applies even to civil society from the developing world from the global south i mean academics and civil society organizations do need some time actually so so some more time for giving public comments and then there's the other option so one is the inputs which would come from the outside but then how will the committee process it how will the secretariat process it i mean if you look at the inclusive framework for i think pillar 1 they had some 3000 4000 pages of uh, documents from the public but they also had a staff of 100 150 people who could digest that information but if the un tax committee is understaffed then how will they digest that information so that's the other side of the of the issue that because it's under resourced the capacity to absorb that public consultation should also be there actually those are all really really interesting points but mentioning the OECD and the discrepancy between the secretariats leads me to my final question for you so right now as we all know the whole world is waiting for the OECD to release its BEPS 2.0 solution and that process has raised many questions about standard setting i mean who should set the rules and why So as far as collaboration or coexistence with the OECD is concerned what kind of relationship do you think that the UN tax committee and the OECD should have with each other Yeah this is a very interesting question and there's the facti panel for example recently came out with its recommendation that the global forum could perhaps be incorporated into the un system similar to how the international organization on migration was uh, incorporated into the un system and i think that's a very interesting idea because the global forum is working on an issue which is of a lot of interest to countries exchange of information transparency and this component of the oecd system i think could definitely be this recommendation of the facti panel can be taken forward for many of the other aspects of the oecd's work if you look at the inclusive framework and their uh, steering group we come back to the issue of transparency it's it's not very clear how the steering group works and you know how decisions are taken given this reality it's unclear uh, what would be the effects of closely merging the two bodies what that would mean because it should not be the case that the constraints which are upon the oecd should also be imposed upon the un as it stands with all its limitations the un tax committee still does give developing countries a forum for an alternative perspective and alternative voice and if somehow by a closer um, integration collaboration that voice gets stifled then that will not be a good thing so it uh, requires some careful thought as to what should be the terms of engagement actually but i think the facti panel's recommendation on the global forum is definitely a concrete uh, suggestion for taking things forward that being said the facti panel also has recommended uh, whose report would be strongly recommended to everyone listening to this it has also recommended that the un tax committee should be uh, converted or upgraded into an intergovernmental body an inclusive intergovernmental body that is actually a much better avenue of thought that uh, instead of scratching our heads wondering how the oecd can become truly inclusive when ultimately the oecd was set up to administer the marshall plan after the destruction of europe in the second world war with all that history legacy i mean you have the un which is set up by the whole world it's a genuinely universal body why not make that the forum for setting tax rules and you know where everybody can come developed and developing countries and then there's no need for okay how is this steering group constituted and if how are decisions taken and i mean all those uh, complexities can be set aside for the oecd to keep thinking and the un tax committee can be made into an intergovernmental body In fact in 2010 Yemen on behalf of the group of 77 had introduced a draft resolution in ECOSOC which would uh, be basically a decision by ECOSOC to upgrade the UN tax committee into an intergovernmental body and I think the resolution is E2010L10 if I remember correctly 
and it had a very interesting idea about what this intergovernmental body would look like. So I think it was 47 member states and they would have uh, four year terms and there was regional breakdown as well. I think there were 13 from Africa and uh, 13 from Asia. And uh, there was a certain number from Western Europe and from Eastern Europe. It was very interesting, actually. The structure and function of the proposed intergovernmental body was described in this resolution by Yemen, which was introduced in ECOSOC in 2010. Well, Abdul, you raised some really interesting points and especially bringing up the FACTI panel, very much appreciated because that report definitely should be read by international tax practitioners to get an idea of the breadth of the panel's recommendations, but also the sheer creativity involved in that. And so I also thank you as well for raising these ideas and raising awareness about how the UN Tax Committee can become more effective. So for those listeners who haven't read Abdul's piece, I very highly recommend that you do. The name is Making the UN Tax Committee More Effective for Developing Countries, and you can find that in Tax Notes International. So, Abdul, we really enjoyed having you today. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was my pleasure. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now from her home is Acquisitions and Engagement Editor-in-Chief, Janelle Julian. Janelle, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In tax notes state, experts consider the impact of pro bono services and the latest installment of the Search for Tax Justice series. Martin Eisenstein and David Sputnam Berland consider Chicago's interpretation of how its personal property lease transaction tax applies to digital and cloud service providers. In Tax Notes International, Carl Schmaltz begins a two part series on the shortcomings in the Platform for Collaboration on Taxes Toolkit on Offshore Indirect Transfers. Two practitioners with Chiumenti in Milan analyze recent Italian guidance on taxing income from the transfer of data. On the opinions page, Joseph Thorndike argues that President Biden and Democrats are determined to avoid repeating the perceived errors around the 2009 stimulus plan during the current crisis. Nana Ama Sarfo gives an overview of what could come down the pipeline now that the UN FACD panel has released its final report on the global financial system. And now for a closer look at what's new and noteworthy in our magazines, here is Tax Notes Federal Editor-in-Chief, Errol Greenblum. Thanks, Janelle. I'm joined by Thomas Newbig, who is a Senior Associate for the Council on Economic Policies and a member of the Tax Analysts Board of Directors. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Thank you, Ariel. Today, we're going to discuss Tom's recent piece in Tax Notes titled, Disparate Racial Impact tax expenditure reform needed. In this article, Tom, you delve into how income and wealth disparities combined with the policy design of tax expenditures disadvantage Black households. Can you tell us about your findings? Absolutely. In the past three years, and particularly the last 12 months, many more policy analysts have written about how the current federal and local tax systems disfavor Black households. The federal tax code has no explicit rules differentiating between race and ethnic groups, but many federal tax provisions can have less favorable effects for Black compared with white households. Federal laws prohibit explicit discrimination or disparate treatment of racial and ethnic groups. In the housing and employment area, federal laws also address differential outcomes, or what is called disparate impact. And this article looks at the disparate racial impact of some important federal tax provisions. For the past few years, I've been working with the Swiss think tank, the Council on Economic Policies, to improve countries' transparency and analysis of tax expenditures. Tax expenditures are government incentive and benefit programs run through the tax code rather than through direct government spending. With increased focus on the income and wealth inequality in the U.S., plus expanded calls for racial equity, I thought it would be possible to quantify the disparate impact of some of the largest tax expenditures. To date, there have been qualitative discussions of such impacts, but not quantitative analysis. So the article uses information on the income and wealth distributions of black and white households from census data, plus information from the Treasury and the Congressional Budget Office on the income distributions of some of the largest tax expenditures. 
black households median and average incomes and also median and average wealth are significantly less than those of white households, 60% in the case of income and 13% in the case of wealth. So black households get smaller shares of the total benefit of tax expenditures that are related to income or wealth due to these income and wealth disparities. But the disparate racial impact is made worse by what is called the upside down nature of many tax expenditures. To illustrate the upside down regressive feature of spending through the tax code, $1,000 of deductions, exemptions or exclusions are worth $370 for the highest income taxpayers, but worth zero or only $120 for lower income taxpayers. Further, some tax credits are not refundable, so they aren't even available to lower income taxpayers. So due to these financial inequities and upside down nature of many tax expenditures, black households receive much less than their proportionate share of the benefits. Black households account for 13% of all American households, but they receive only 7% of the benefit of the mortgage interest deduction and only 5% from the preferential tax rates on capital gains and dividends. Now, tax expenditures don't have to disfavor black households. I estimate that black households receive 18% of the refundable earned income tax credit and 15% of the partially refundable child tax credit. This occurs because those credits are refundable for the most part and are also targeted at lower income families. So the article tries to highlight that a greater focus on equity is needed when considering government tax policy. Besides just income distributions, policymakers would benefit from knowing the racial and ethnicity distributions of government tax incentives, just as they see them in analyses of government spending programs. So what kind of steps can policymakers and lawmakers take to address the problem? Well, the article suggests eight different steps to consider in reforming tax expenditures while reducing racial and income disparities. I'll list a few. First, there has to be a recognition that facially neutral tax policies can still have disparate racial impacts. The new focus on racial inequities in the U.S. is an important additional reason for an immediate review of federal tax expenditures. Second, measurement and analysis matters. So it is critical to have better data on race and ethnicity in tax policy. The easiest way would be to have race and ethnicity collected on federal tax returns, which it currently is not. That would be similar to how race and ethnicity is collected in most other government programs. So that information is available for other government programs, but not in the tax area. There are certainly pros and cons to collecting the information on tax returns. But I would argue when significant government benefits and incentives are involved, the racial and ethnicity impacts are needed for policymakers to consider. Of course, if that data was collected on 2021 tax returns, the data would not be available to analyze for several years. So the Treasury and the Joint Committee on Taxation, as well as outside tax policy analysts, should use statistical imputations of race and ethnicity in their modeling analyses. Treasury and the JCT already make such imputations, such as for non-filing households, They also impute data not on tax returns, such as employer health insurance premiums and income and pension accounts. Imputations are never perfect, but they provide important tax policy insights. Third, disparate racial impacts could be reduced by converting deductions and exemptions into refundable tax credits. So all households eligible for an activity receive the same proportionate benefit. That would help lower and middle income households. Eligibility limits on income or assets could also better target the benefits of tax expenditures. I personally don't think retirement savings in excess of $5 million or $10 million require tax incentives. And those tax incentives currently add to the racial income and wealth inequalities in the U.S. And finally, revenue raised by reforming tax expenditures should be used to redesign tax expenditures and also to finance improved government expenditures, addressing education, health, and housing disparities. It is not simply taxes, but whole-of-government efforts that need to address racial inequalities. We're lucky to have you as a part of a webinar panel that Tax Analysts is hosting on April 14th on this very topic. Can you give us a preview of this Taxing Issues webinar? 
Sure. Even before the 2020 election, there was a need for a thorough review and reform of federal tax expenditures. It hasn't really occurred since the 1986 Tax Reform Act. One of President Biden's first executive orders requires agencies to evaluate whether and to what extent, quote, programs and policies perpetuate systematic barriers to opportunities and benefits for people of color, unquote. The Biden campaign and the America Recovery Plan have also included proposals and actual legislation for greater use of refundable tax credits, which is important in terms of addressing racial inequities. And then with the significant financing needs of the president's infrastructure proposal and the current large budget deficits, reforming tax expenditure should be an important part of the coming tax policy debate. Increased transparency and thorough analysis of tax expenditures are an important precursor to meaningful tax reform. The upcoming Taxing Issues webinar will be a worthwhile debate among several of us on how to use tax expenditure analysis more constructively. I look forward to participating in the webinar and hope listeners of this podcast will join the webinar on April 14th. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for joining us on the podcast today. You can find Tom's article online at taxnotes.com. And be sure to sign up for the next Taxing Issues webinar on reforming tax expenditures held on April 14th. You can register today at events.taxanalysts.org. Again, that's events.taxanalysts.org. Back to you, Dave. You can read all that and a lot more in the pages of Tax Notes Federal, State, and International. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at taxdew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening, and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Analyst Inc. does not provide tax advice or tax preparation services. Nothing in the podcast constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice. A full disclaimer is included in the transcript.